Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. This is Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast on understanding and treating self-harm. So I'm going to talk a little bit about suicidality tonight, but that's not going to be the focus. But I, I'll, I'll talk about it in contrast to self-harm, what it is and what it isn't. As I was preparing for this broadcast this evening, I was thinking about something in regards to, to more generally the idea of mental health and mental health symptoms. And I wrote this thing today and, and shared it, this idea that if we just consider the symptom or, or the defense, if we pay too much attention or focus on it too much, it's doing its job. That in part, the symptom or the defense serves to distract the individual from authentic suffering, from authentic pain, from the real and primary wound. And so it's very important. And I think that that's why that, that self-harm can be so triggering and insidious for so many of our, our people is that it, it evokes in most parents and, and most people around a really strong trauma response, right? A really strong fear and, and flight response. And so it, it oftentimes takes other people outside of, of ourselves to be able to help us get grounded and, and to see it. I've used this as, as an example in previous broadcasts not even in, in regard to to self-harm, but talked about the idea that if my child was hurting themselves, it would be very hard for me to to contain that, right? To, to respond to that in, in a curious and, and calm and, and patient way. On the other hand, I can do that very effectively in most cases for the clients that I work with because I, I have some distance. It allows me, it doesn't trigger me in the same way that my own own children are triggered. And so that is why we go back to this, this adage, this idea that one of the reasons why we send our children to treatment and it can be justified is the idea that others can respond to, to things like self-harm in ways that, that are going to be helpful because they're not as triggered. So with that forward, I'll, I'll get right into it. Let's talk about defining self-harm. It's inflicting yourself with some sort of injury or harm without the intent of suicide. So principally, and, and again, to the trauma-triggered mind of a parent, or, or it doesn't have to be a parent, but they're the most vulnerable to that when it comes to their child, to the trauma-triggered mind, the, they look one and the same. It's hard to distinguish, right? The trauma-triggered mind goes to the worst possible scenario, goes to the worst outcome. But, but self-harm is defined as non not having a suicidal intention. I'll say this later on also, that one of the risks and dangers of self-harm is because it can become blurry somewhere in the middle. And somebody who's demonstrating dangerous or self-harming behaviors, risky behaviors, can miscalculate and make a mistake. Fear and our trauma as parents, as loved ones around those that are struggling. So examples are cutting, scratching, embedding objects, burning yourselves, uh, hitting yourself, hitting objects, not intending, not attending to wounds or injuries. Sometimes in the fields, we, we even have students who try to expose themselves to the elements, right? We've had kids that have tried to, to expose themselves to infection so that they would get the, the kind of response that they're, that they're looking for. Ingesting objects that, that are harmful, even in a wilderness therapy program, even in a hospital, one of the ways that people might self-harm when they feel like the supervision is so high is by swallowing something that they're not supposed to, a rock, for example, something as, as simple and primitive as that. Not necessarily talking about mood-altering substances where we're going to have like an accidental overdose or, or for the purpose of escape, but we're talking about something for the purpose of harm, knowing that it's going to only create harm. Like I said, it, it can be a precursor. And somewhere in the middle between self-harm and suicide on the continuum, you can kind of cross over. And that's why it takes others and, and, and people that are skilled and practice that assessment to help us. Right? They're not uh, fortune tellers, but they can help us. They can provide a, a more grounded response and assessment of our children. This is important. Why do we do it? Because again, if we just treat the symptom, if we just respond to the symptom, and this applies to all symptoms in mental health, then the symptom wins. It is in part doing its work. Somebody posted on my social media timeline today, 
You're right, Brad. It's a red herring. That's a philosophical argument tactic to draw somebody's attention away from what the real issue is. So we talk about primary and secondary gain as motivators. Primary gain is simply seen as pain or anxiety reducing. So something I do to myself to take away my emotional discomfort. So self-harm can be numbing. Now, now, it doesn't make sense to call it numbing because it often causes pain. But again, it numbs the person. It, it diverts the focus from the primary or, or the authentic wound is what we might say to something more superficial, easier to tolerate. So in that way, it has a numbing effect. Soothing. The people will talk about this idea that it brings them a sense of relief. Sometimes to direct, and that's what self-harm is in part, to direct pain inward feels somehow satisfying and cathartic. Like I'm I'm, I'm closing the circle, closing the loop on, on my self-disgust, my self-hatred. It can be a distraction or an escape. This is too simple of a thing to say, although I'm going to say it anyway. And that is the idea that, that mental health symptoms are, in general, distra distractions or escape. It is an unwillingness or inability to be present in our lives. And it can become, this is very important, it can become compulsive or addictive. That can happen because of brain chemistry, right? Tolerance builds up. Our, our brain sends out signals to comfort us after we've harmed ourselves or, or, or ingested a substance. And then without that kind of behavior, there's this vacuum that is left where it becomes even more uncomfortable. So we can develop an addiction to behaviors that can, can become compulsive. And while we often talk about, this is something that I think is, often mistaught to people. We talk about as therapists, we talk about the purpose of our symptoms. And I've talked about it already a few times in this, in this broadcast about the purpose of our symptoms. That's really early on. After the behavior or, or the substance becomes, qualifies for addiction or compulsion, it's not a conscious decision, right? It becomes a habit, unconscious much less like a choice than it was in the earlier stages of, of experimentation or, or use or behavior. Sometimes people will describe it as feeling something, right? I want to feel something. And, and the, the idea that depression isn't necessarily a, a sadness, although it has it in it, it's a lack of feeling in some ways, right? It's a depression, right? A, an absence of something. Sometimes the way out of depression or in most cases, the way out of depression is to learn to feel even, even our pain, our sadness, and our grief. And then there's this sense of control over our pain, right? Because it's not necessarily true in, in every single case, but a core piece of trauma is the loss of control, right? I'm not choosing this. Something in my environment, somebody in my environment is doing something to me that I have no control over. So self-harm restores that. That is why also, I think this is a fascinating concept. When we think about parenting or, or, or therapy, it's very important to be careful how much we out somebody, how much we use what I call our X-ray vision, how much we identify and confront, confront the defense. Because even when it's framed, by us in our minds as an attempt to help it still includes the loss of power or control so sometimes that's why therapists will do non-intuitive things they'll ask you to do non-intuitive things because you're asking uh they're asking you to to help the individual who's suffering maintain a sense of control and that's why therapy looks counterintuitive or even i say invisible to people who really don't know what it is Simply identifying, confronting the defense, talking about solutions isn't therapy. It's a very, very small part of therapy, but it is not therapy. Therapy is learning to honor the defense, to listen to the defense, to listen to the story the defense is trying to tell us. And I know as a father, and I'm sure this is true 
for those of you that are, that are parents in this process, that you know that the instinct to lecture or solve it or confront it or call somebody out or out someone is strong. The impulse is strong in those areas. And that's why therapy is a different activity. It's a different task. It's a different process. So that's we, we've talked about the primary gain. The secondary gain is the effect it has on others around me, on my environment, my context. So I use the simple example of biting my fingernails to distinguish between primary gain and secondary gain. If I bite my fingernails, and that is anxiety reducing, right? Like it, it takes away some nervous energy, focuses on something I can control. That's the primary gain. The secondary gain might be the attention I get from my father or mother or teacher or boyfriend or girlfriend. So secondary gain is the relationship or the contextual effect. Oftentimes it, it, it is simply that to get attention. And the old phrase, the old saying, uh, you know, any news is good news, right? Bad news is good news. It's publicity. The same is with true with attention. Any attention is good attention. I would rather be paid attention to even negatively than ignored because abandonment is the greatest risk to us. Projective identification of helpless or powerlessness. Now, that's a lot of words. Projective identification goes beyond simple projection. Simple projection is parts of myself that I split off, that I ignore, that I deny, and see them in other people. Everybody listening to this is familiar with projection. Projective identification goes one step further. That is to induce in the other person the feeling that I am having. So if I'm feeling powerless and helpless, I want you to feel that. If I'm feeling hurt, I want you to feel that. So I will treat you as if. I, I will engage you in a way to provoke that. You know how sometimes you've been on both ends of this, where somebody seems to be looking for a solution, right? They seem to be looking for uh, some kind of step to solve the problem. And anytime you or anytime you're offered the solution, you you, you shoot it down or, or you don't take the advice, that can be understood as projective identification. I want my spouse, my therapist, my parent to feel the same kind of helpless and powerlessness that I feel to solve the problems. If the problem were easily solved by a simple lecture or advice, we wouldn't need therapists, number one. And number two, if the problem were solved by, by simple advice or, or steps, it would diminish the depth of our pain. I won't let you solve my problem because if it's too easy, it doesn't give credibility. It doesn't give weight and value to the pain that that symptom, that that defense is seeking to cover up. Sometimes it pushes people away, creates distance between us and others. That can be through conflict or through just avoidance. Sometimes it can be a passive attack on the people that we love, right? Think about this. This is an obvious idea. The greatest, most precious thing in your life is your child, right? The thing that you feel perhaps, for most people we'll say, the most love that they feel for anybody, anything in their life. And if somebody's trying to hurt that, that's the greatest threat that you can experience, the greatest pain that you can empathically experience. So if somebody's hurting your child, that, that's the pain, that's the hurt. It's, a, it's like attacking you. We're so identified with them. And it's true even if it's the child. So instead of attacking you, if you're my parent, instead of attacking you, I'm going to attack myself, which hurts you. But does it in such a backwards way that I don't, I don't get the same kind of negative attention or attack I might get if I were acting out on you. What are the signs to look for? They are individuals who practice self-harm are often experts at hiding it once it becomes more compulsive. Sometimes in the early phases, not so much. Long sleeves at, at inappropriate times, right? Hiding and invisible, like not being around, being avoidant. You know, being really shy and invisible, unexplained or 
odd explanation for wounds. Bloody tissues, towels, or clothes. Tolerance and escalation, right? It gets worse over time. They'll find secret places to cut and self-harm. Oftentimes, children, when it gets advanced, will cut on the upper inside of their, their thighs, for example, because that's not going to be a place that you're going to usually or anybody's going to usually inspect. And that has a different purpose. That might not be the one who's doing it for attention, or it might have progressed to a level where they're not doing it for attention anymore because they're trying to hide it. A stash of razors or sharp objects, for example, is another sign to be looking for. Let's talk about the danger, risk, the, the, the lethality of self-harm. Like I said, it's a continuum, but by definition, self-harm is not the same as suicidality. However, it can escalate. It has a, an addic addictive and compulsive nature that can often build a tolerance, and then it becomes dangerous, and, and the individual can make a mistake, put their life at risk. Sometimes reckless driving, dangerous activities, right? Risk-taking behaviors can be defined as self-harm. Somebody putting themselves in harm, harm's way. Even though suicide might not be the conscious, overt intent. The common threads between self-harm and suicide is the desire to escape and shame. And shame, remember, we talk about this all the time. It's probably one of the most talked about concepts in, in psychology and self-help self -help in, in our culture is the attempt to shrink, to disappear, to not be a burden, to not expose anybody to, to anything about me that would make them feel uncomfortable or pained by. Self-harm, dangerous activities, like I said, reckless behavior and suicide always have, all, all have the common themes of escape and, and danger to themselves. So when we talk about assessing suicidality, it's, it's difficult. I, I want to say this. If somebody wants to do it, and usually it's not the first attempt, but if somebody wants to do it, eventually they can, which is a horrifying thought and feeling. But most people, the majority of people, don't necessarily want to do it. It just becomes this thing that they obsess over that they imagine will relieve them of their pain. You're asking about thoughts. How developed are the thoughts? I've talked to people who said that they have used the fantasy of suicide while they've assessed themselves as, as low on the suicide scale, one to 10. They've talked about the, the, the fantasy of suicide being an obsessive thought that provides them with escape. Somebody told me recently, imagining a, a knife in their stomach was something they did to get through the, the, the pain of their day. And then you start to talk about plan. Do they have a means to fulfill that plan? Are they, how are they going to do it? Where are they going to do it? Do they have the supplies, the, the, the medication, the pills, the, 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 the gun, whatever it is? Is there a history? Right? This, this runs in families. Is it something that's happened in your community as of late? Is there publicity around it? So you're looking at the context and the, the familial history that adds to the suicidality or, or the lethality of it when we consider all other things. Um, does the person feel out of control? Can they keep themselves safe? Will they, will they self-report? Oftentimes, more, well, more mild, they'll be more verbal, verbal about it. Early on in the fantasy or, or the attempt, if they've had more than one attempt, they'll be more overt or... or more verbal about it, and later on, if it becomes lethal, they'll be non-communicative. And oftentimes, they will look good. The ones who are successful will look good right before they do it. We start to look at any self-injury behavior and how serious is, is, is it. There's a very big difference between scratching and cuts in the arm, for example, that require stitches. And then, you know, part of your assessment with, with what level of intervention you're going to take is, are they willing to talk about it and be part of the intervention? And, and this is one of those mental health symptoms where the state will take away the individual's right for freedom. It's, it's, 
it's one of the things that that you can do to get somebody involuntarily committed to therapy in most states in the states that we operate in for sure um the 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 mental health disorders or issues that it's related to is depression of course bipolar anxiety and personality disorders which are more um consistent and chronic less treatable or more difficult to treat borderline personality disorder dependent personality disorder histrionic borderline is erratic relationships attention seeking behavior uh, an unstable commitment to safety of oneself right they take they do dangerous behaviors acting out both for attention seeking and for escape and for a sense of control dependent is what it sounds like somebody who's who's needy and during a breakup dependent personality disorders for example will feel absolutely dreadfully hopeless histrionic is more attention seeking right it's demonstrative um emotional um really really uh, outspoken outlandish kind of behavior people with eating disorders and body image issues that makes sense doesn't it because if they hate their body self-harm often is a way to express that hatred hatred at, at, towards oneself victims of trauma or those suffer from ptsd it is an escape from the more the deeper more authentic pain it's not very common it's not as common with substance abuse disorders and what's becoming more and more apparent is how common it is among lgbtq plus populations because of the, the the reaction from their context because of accepting versus not accepting family members the the the, the rates of suicidality and self-harm skyrocket when they have a highly non-accepting context religious family of origin context up to nine times as likely as anybody else and that drops down to only twice as likely when the family is moderately disapproving so highly disapproving nine times more likely than average moderately disapproving right Th those are more subtle forms you're still twice as likely to, to fantasize or, or attempt suicide but all of these have in common the, all of these behaviors and populations have in common suicidality and self-harm so how do we respond i'm going to list some things that are um easily defined as heroic because it's it's unnatural and that is listen rather than talk ask questions again calmly ask what it does for them what's it trying to tell them how are they feeling and be patient with that kind of dialogue learn to to, to suppress your 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 fight or flight response and sort that out with somebody else um themes when, when you discuss it often include not feeling understood right that makes sense feeling invisible and alone i i write about this 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 might be the the underlying thesis of all of my work and that is this that we can't fix people's dilemmas often a lot of people's well-earned pain is unfixable the only thing that we can do is be there with them in it which takes a great deal of strength and, and tolerance and stamina for us so learning to sit with somebody so they don't feel alone and by the way this is this is crazy but important trying to fix it will often cause them to feel alienated and alone because they've already worked out the equation in their their head as unwinnable damned if i do damned if i don't is what they're telling themselves what they believe and if we listen close enough we can hear that story and we can relate to it and while leaning into it and, and, and relating to it and saying things like that makes sense feel so counterintuitive and feel like it's going to embolden the problem it doesn't because the real wound is the loneliness 
the isolation, the lack of connection. A person who feels impotent, powerless, and helpless, like I talked about, it's about control. And then fundamentally, it's about shame. And this is why I, I spent so much energy over the past couple of years on, on talking to parents about that is because part of, of self-harm and, and, and more severe in, in the case of suicide alley, of course, is I'm the cause of the people who love me the most. I'm the cause of their pain and distress. It's why it's so important, fundamentally important, that you get support from somebody else, somebody besides your loved one who's struggling with mental health or addiction issues. If you come to them with your pain and distress and worry and sadness and fear, you are heaping on top of them more shame because they're causing it, of course. You're, you're implying that they're causing it because you're saying your behavior causes me to feel this way. So you go to other places to get support for those feelings so that when you're in the presence of your child or your loved one, you are there for them and not asking them to be there for you. So shame is exacerbated in these situations. It's the core of it. Somebody said to me one time, I was being interviewed shortly after the, the, the suicide of a, of a celebrity on a radio station. And I'd been talking to several friends about the, the cause, because this person was known to be an addict and also known to be to struggle with depression. And so I, I got lots of people's opinions. But my, my good friend and colleague, Danny Conroy, he runs a program in, in Boulder, Colorado called Aim House. He said to me, it was shame that killed him. Shame is the impulse to go away, to run away. It's the ultimate running away. <laughs> Excuse me. So the, the, the cause, because we can work through a lot, but we can't work through it if the impulse to go away is too strong. We won't work on it. We can, of course, but we won't if it becomes too strong. Um. Try to avoid asking questions that are yes or no questions. Ask questions that are open-ended, description questions, without, without the idea of them getting it right. That, that's really important. I don't want to overstate this, but it almost can't be overstated, that, that in a dialogue that's going to be helpful psychologically for, for somebody, you want to ask questions that have no right answer. And then remember, when you get the answer, that there's no right or wrong answer. Because the thing that's going to sound like, quote unquote, the wrong answer is going to be the truth. And, and that's where it comes in with this next idea of validate them, even if it seems crazy or off. Because when there's mental illness, even to a moderate level, the story makes sense in some context, right? The symptom serves them in some context. It might be crazy in your mind, but in some context, it makes perfect sense. So validating it in that context alle alleviates the pressure, the stress, the alienation, the aloneness, the shame. It is what I would call psychological grace. Avoid giving them back powerful emotional responses, right? Fear, anger, that's only gonna, gonna layer on top of what already feels like a great burden, more weight. Welcome discussions and dialogues. Again, you have the right as a parent, for an adolescent at least, and even an adult, if it's life-threatening, you have the right to act. You always reserve that right, and that is your call. But developing greater bandwidth to be able to have really difficult discussions. I would bet that those that, that are watching this, this broadcast and listening to it on the podcast app would say to, to everybody, one of the things that, that this process, going through a, a struggle with somebody that I love who has a mental health issue or an addiction, has increased my bandwidth greatly. It's one of the gifts uh, of this. 
especially as you look inward at your own history and pain, right? Your, your, your ability to hold space, to, to listen empathically, to listen without judgment increases. And that increase is a healing bomb to others. Family therapy becomes a way to communicate support and to avoid focus on the identified patient, right? We start to talk about it less behaviorally in family therapy, less fix or not fix, less, less black and white as a function of the overall system. I skip this idea that I'll go back to it. Learn new language, develop new language to identify feelings to replace the behavior, right? That, that's what cutting is saying something. Self-harm is saying something. So giving it words means that we don't need the behavior anymore. And our contribution, if we love somebody who's struggling with this, our contribution to that, that, that task of developing words to replace the behavior is creating a safe place. Own and express your feelings assertively, but again, own them. They're yours. Your serenity is your responsibility. And I know the, the, the mothers and the fathers that are watching or listening to this would, would want to argue in some cases, of course, it's unnatural for a parent not to be upset or scared by their child's behavior when it meets this, this level. And my answer is yes, that's what I'm saying. It's real. It's valid. It's normal. It's healthy. It's a sign of your love. So go somewhere and get support for it but not to the child or not to the spouse who's struggling. Be pragmatic instead of threatening, threatening, guilting, or catastrophizing, right? Threatening, guilting, or catastrophizing are, are all trauma responses. And so we learn to calm the language, to deal with it practically, instead of to, to try to create fear and, and, and intimidation and motivation from a powerful emotional source. Somebody told me one time when talking about suicide, don't say anything if you can't say everything because it's too big of a topic. And I'll just acknowledge I can't say everything about it. I can't speak to all of the facets of suicidality. I can't speak to everybody's experience. I've worked with families who have lost loved ones to suicide in the past. And one of the things that they've, they've said to me that I, I can't possibly begin to comprehend is I'm glad that that person is out of their pain. It must have been too hard for them. And in every case, that's come after lots and lots of effort and energy and attempts and interventions to try to save that individual's life. I talked about the radio show example of, of the suicide, that it, it, is, it is the cause for suicide in, in many cases. I tell this story all the time. It was something that was told to me during an especially dark time in my life where I wasn't suicidal, but I was fantasizing about it. And my therapist said to me, the suicidal impulse is correct. The, the mistake that people make that are suicidal, that attempt suicide is, is that they don't realize that they need to kill part of themselves, not the entire self. And so it becomes the, the project to discover what part of it is that you need to get rid of to be free. And in my case, it, it principally is what other people think about me, right? I, I'm so codependent and, and empathically compromised. It's what makes me a, a good therapist, I suppose, but it also becomes a great burden because I can't sit by very easily and watch people that I care about suffer. I can't watch other people be mad at me. I can't hurt other people. Even if it's if, if it's a healthy thing for me to do or to take care of myself, I can't let somebody down. And everybody listening to the, the sound of my voice knows how that can become a prison. So I work on, on letting go of what other people think. So I don't have to I don't have to die. I just have to kill that part of myself. Like I said, it, it, it sometimes it's just to make the pain go away. People that attempt or commit suicide, they just can't tolerate the pain anymore or the hopelessness. So what do you do? 
when you have somebody who struggles with, with suicidal impulses, behaviors, you do everything you can. And you don't let any therapist recommend something where you're required to take it um, at face value if, if the risk is suicide. You get to do whatever you want to do because you're the one who loves the child the most. And so when, when somebody says you kick your son out of the house if he's using heroin, nobody should tell you to do that. The risks are too great. You have to do what you think is right because you're the one who has to live with it. I put on here Chester Bennington. He was the lead singer of, of a, a band, a rock band that was big in the early 2000s. And uh, Lincoln Park was the name of it. Um, and his wife shared, he, he, he committed, he uh, lost his life to suicide a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And his wife posted a video of him just hours before he died by suicide. And um, the interesting thing was, is he looked as happy and carefree as you could possibly be. So we can't control it ultimately. And that doesn't mean we don't do anything. It just means that we do everything that we can knowing that ultimately we can't prevent everything that we want to prevent. So I listed some resources here. I'll read those to you that are listening. Cutting by Stephen. Uh, looks like his name is pronounced Levincron. I've only read it. I haven't, I haven't heard it said by anybody else. Inside a Cutter's Mind by Joshua uh, Jerisha Clark and Dr. Earl Henslin. Bloodletting, a memoir of secret self-harm and survival by Victoria Lethem. Skin Game by Caroline Kettlewell. Get Me Out of Here, My Recovery from Borderline Personality Disorder by Rachel Reeland. And if you want resources to write Love on Her Arms, go to www.twloha, that's the acronym to write Love on Her Arms, twloha.com. Of course, if the threat is immediate, call 911. Call the emergency. I've had to call 911 on clients before in an office. I've had to hide that from them, go out for a break, call 911, come back to the office and wait for the sheriff to knock on the door. So they, 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 there's a, a ethical principle when it comes to therapists reporting clients that are at risk for suicide. And that is a, a therapist may not may not take into considerations the relationship with the client as a way to avoid reporting the person for suicide lethality. So I had to do that. In fact, the person felt very betrayed by me in the moment, was very angry with me, came back after some time in the hospital and then thanked me for it. But I was willing to do it, as would you be, even if he never forgave me. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 800-273-TALK, 800-273-TALK. LGBT Lifeline, 866-488-7386. And then the Crisis Team Text Line, text LISTEN to 741741. And again, just being connected to someone, just being heard is, is the bomb that, that, that cures it. It's not taking away the pain or solving the problem. It's just not being alone in it. I'm happy to take any questions that, that have come up and then I'll go to upcoming announcements and then I'll have some more time for questions if there are any. So for the take home, for, for what you take home, it is to challenge your initial reaction to self-harm from panic and fear to curiosity. Managing your emotional response so that you can be a safe place for, for the other. Instead of focusing on the symptom, listen for the wound beneath it. That's what I started off with tonight. Dialectical behavioral therapy. If you want to do a search, there's even a, a podcast about that, a webinar about that. Learn about dialectical behavioral therapy. 
and learn about programs that use it because they can they are shown to be in the research very effective for people that are high risk for self-harm and suicidality read books get support from people who have been through it go to therapy go to your own therapy go to support groups for family members of borderline personality disorder addicts or self-harmers practice self-care don't give up on your life it's very important that your children that are struggling know that you're taking care of you because if they think it's their job to take care of you and they have some sense that they're failing at it, again, it only adds to their burden. So it's okay for you to take care of you and to be unavailable for people at times because you're practicing healthy self-care, exercise, happiness, vacations, time off from problems, therapy. All right, folks, thanks for joining me tonight. Parent workshops coming up. If we invite all parents that possibly can attend to go to the January 25th um parents of parent workshop excuse me in our southern utah location you can combine that with a parent trip go to our, the parent portal to find out more about those our next parent support group will be in new york city monday january 27th 7 p.m eastern time at the cuny building that is uh, uh, that's on um 34th and 5th avenue in midtown we'll be listing more meetings coming up um soon any questions or to RSVP, email melanie at evoketherapy.com. If you want to do a deep dive, I say this every time. I don't think that there's a thing that you can be that's more worth your time and money and resources than coming to a personal intensive, an intensive for you. It's a therapeutic five-day experience of uncovering who you are and, and how that relates to the parenting, the, the relationship dilemmas, the, the stress, the anxiety. The grief in your life so finding you the next one is january 8th through 12th i know it's filling up it's going to be a fantastic one i just finished running one on sunday and it was an absolute blissful joy for me to reconnect to that we also have customized intensives for couples families professionals and individuals go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information pursuits trips are adventure trips all around the world Think sober, fun, or reconnecting therapy light. Young adults, families, couples. We ask all current families to go to six 12-step support groups. Any combination of Al-Anon, Codependence Anonymous, Families Anonymous. Adult Children is a great program. If you grew up in a particularly toxic family, adultchildren.org is a great place to go. Alateen is for teens. RefugeRecovery.org is a great support group that some people love and prefer. It's Buddhist inspired, less focused on a on a higher power, more focused on Eastern philosophy and mindfulness. And then the National Alliance on Mental Illness at NAMI.org is a great place to go to get resources and free classes in your area. All of these broadcasts are available on on your favorite podcast app on an iOS device. Use the the, the podcast app on an Android device. Use the SoundCloud app or on your computer, go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy programs using the handle at Evoke Therapy, or you can find the Summit Lodge, that's the intensive program, on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Summit Lodge. On Facebook, you can find Evoke by searching Evoke Therapy programs. The Alumni Foundation is also on Facebook. That's an organization of former parents who have banded together to raise money to help people who can't afford therapy. And then the Evoke Therapy blog on our website is a great source. The Journey of the Heroic Parent is available on Amazon, also on Audible. Um, and if you go through the Parent Alumni Foundation book page and buy any book through the Amazon Smiles program there, a percentage of the proceeds goes to people who need help paying for therapy. My new book will be out in January, The Audacity to Be You on Being a Self and Loving Another. I look forward to that and will, of course, tell you all about that once it comes out. I'll have a, a webinar broadcast on that. Happy to take any live questions. Looks like one has come in. Parent says, my daughter's at Cascades, young adult right now, and on, on, her second stretch, uh, on her second stretch with Evoke Therapy programs. She wrote to her parents about how to support her when she is self-harming and has said that it is her biggest red flag that she is in a spiral. That's great. She has asked us to be upfront with her in compassion and love in those moments. She will also go back to a boarding school to finish up her last semester of high school in January. I am okay doing this to some extent, but feel very concerned about how emotions are high when these struggles are happening. Any words to to help? I mean, my words to help are, you're right. 
It's hard. Um, it's hard to be the parent. And, and what your daughter's asking for makes sense and is in line with, with, with what we talked about. And so you need a you need a practice. And it's still going to be hard. By the way, folks, you're going to fail at this. You're going to fail at all of this. Everything I talk about, I fail out of it, for, fail at all of it more than I would like to admit. And so you don't have to be perfect. You just have to apologize and own it. It's your trauma response coming up, right? That, that's earned, that's deserved, just like theirs. So be kind to yourself, be patient, do your own work, develop a program uh, of healthy self-care and self-maintenance that creates an ability, like I said, the bandwidth for you to be there for them. And you can get better. I am better at it now than I was 20 years ago as a therapist and a father. I have much more bandwidth with my youngest, who's 12 right now, than I did with my oldest, who's 26 right now. A, a much different parent. So it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's natural to react, get support and help, develop a program. Your daughter is wise and it's scary. It is scary. And I'm better with it with your child than I am with my own child. So you're not alone. All right, looks like there are no other questions or comments. Thank you for joining us. The, just attending this becomes a part of the, 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 the self-care program, right? If you're listening to the podcast, if you're watching this live or recorded on, on the webinars, listening to these becomes um, an immersion, a, a practice, and, and a new sensibility, right? A new awareness, a new way of, of living and being in relationship with another person. That's what the next book is about is the, uh, developing a, a new kind of sensibility. Somebody asked the question, is self-harm due to anxiety disorder? Can one get over it? Yes, for sure. Most do. The, the great majority do. And absolutely, it can be related to anxiety. Absolutely. Both things are true. Very treatable. Very treatable. Rarely does it become a lifelong behavioral compulsion. There might be an instinct there, but rarely does it become a lifelong process. In some cases, it does, of course. I can't diminish that. But most people move through it, grow out of it, get treatment for it, and heal from it. Someone says, I am a family doctor. Any thoughts about what to say or ask when noting old cuts on an exam? I, I, that's a great question. Gosh, you're in a fantastic position. Same thing I told you earlier. Calm and curious, low reactive, non-shaming. You know, when I've had a discussion with somebody outside of my clinical practice, outside of being a therapist and talk with people about it, I, I act as if I, I haven't practiced the same kind of self-harm, but I relate to it. I know what that feels like. I've, I've I know the instinct. I, I know, I know the desire to escape. And so I, I relate to it. It's great to see in wilderness because you'll see two students sitting next to each other and one who doesn't have that behavior at all. And will say, well, I don't have that behavior. Here's how I can relate to it. So a calm, curious, open response is best. Another parent says, my daughter also has a big tendency for attention seeking behavior compounded by the self-harm. It's very hard to know when she is faking, exaggerating, or if it's real. This causes more trauma response in me than, so, than the self-harm, actually. I'm glad you said that. Because responding to it in a calm, non-reactive way works both ways, right? Right? It works if it's self-harm for the sake of escape or self-harm for the sake of attention. Primary gain or secondary gain? A low-key response is the best response in both cases. So you don't have to know which it is. A low-key response, emotionally speaking, is the most effective response in, in contributing to the reduction of the behavior. All right, folks, I'm off next week for the holidays, so I'll be back uh, right near the new year. It'll be December 30th will be my next broadcast. Um, we're going to talk about, with the new year, Therapeutic goals and objectives. Um, I have some non-intuitive things to talk about when it comes to therapeutic goals and objectives. And I'm going to talk about the behavioral contract 
in connection with this or contracts with, with children in connection with this. One last question before I wrap. Can overreacting or eating the wrong foods too much be part of self-harm or is it always just a lack of self-control and dieting? Absolutely. Right? It's a continuum. Right? It, it is. I mean, it has all the same tenets. I overeat sometimes and so it's to escape, to numb, right? To not feel empty or alone, to get comfort. And I know intellectually it's, it's harmful. So yeah, it, that's a great example of relating to somebody in, in, in quite an, a subacute behavior, overeating, with somebody who's showing something more acute like cutting. That's a wonderful, wonderful example. So thank you for that. All right, folks. Thank you for joining us for and on behalf of your children. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for for investing. Thank you for listening. I will talk to you just before the new year on December 30th. Therapy to goals and objectives, including a discussion about behavioral contracts. Take care. Have a great week. And I'll talk to you on Monday, December 30th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Bye-bye.